Uh, this morning, we are in 1 Timothy chapter 4, verses 1 through 6. So hear the word of the Lord. Now the Spirit expressly says that in latter times, some will depart from the faith by devoting themselves to deceitful spirits and teachings of demons through the insincerity of liars whose consciences are seared, who forbid marriage and require abstinence from foods that God created to be received with thanksgiving by those who believe and know the truth. For everything created by God is good, and nothing is to be rejected if it is received with thanksgiving. For it is made holy by the word of God in prayer. If you put these things before the brothers, you will be a good servant of Christ Jesus, being trained in the words of faith and of good doctrine that you have followed. The word of the Lord. You may be seated. All right, let us pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for um, the letter to Timothy from Paul. Thank you for all the wise words that Paul's bestowing to his um, fellow worker in the gospel and younger worker in the gospel. We ask that you would um, open our minds and our hearts to hear and understand your word this morning. Uh, guard my mouth as I preach. Let it be edifying and upbuilding to the church for the, perfecting and the up, for the perfecting and the building up of the church. And let it uh, convict and encourage us and lead us into life. In the name of Christ we pray. Amen. So this morning, uh, as Dan mentioned last week, if you're here, we have uh, an interesting phrase, the doctrine of demons, or in many translations, the teachings of demons. And what are those? And as I was looking through the bulletin, I realized that I sent Pastor Daniel Ralph a typo. The sermon title says, Godliness and the Material World. What I meant to say was godliness in the material world, i.e. what we're talking about today is how to act godly with the physical world. That is at the core of the message. It is how do we interact with the created world, not with people necessarily, not with um, what do we make with our hands, but how do we interact with what God has created? And so as we progress through 1 Timothy, it's more and more important that we understand where we have been, where we're coming from, because Paul builds on his teachings beforehand. Uh, I don't know if you notice in all of his letters, he kind of has long run-on sentences, and it's really hard to just pinpoint one verse and then talk about that verse without seeing the 20 other verses before and the 15 other verses after it. So I want to remind us last week what was talked about, because it has a lot of importance for today. And last week, what was talked about was the mystery of godliness. And Dan talked about the mystery of godliness being Christ Jesus himself. And it's perfectly summarized in 1 Timothy uh, chapter 3, verse 16. It says, He was manifested, that is Christ, in the flesh, vindicated by the Spirit, seen by angels, proclaimed among the nations, believed on in the world, taken up into glory. This mystery, which was hidden before time, before Christ came, has now been revealed. As Augustine says when talking about the Old and New Testament, and it pertains to this, the new, I mean, the old is the new concealed. But the new, that is the New Testament, is the old revealed. We have come into a fullness of time, a fullness of revelation, a fullness of that mystery which was hidden before and is now made manifest in Christ Jesus. So how does it pertain to this passage? Well, this passage then talks about how we are to portray said godliness in life and specifically in the created world, in interacting with the physical world and how it impacts our brother and sisters in Christ. And so guiding the whole sermon, I want to pull a verse from Romans chapter 14, verse 23. And I think it's a very good guiding principle as we go about understanding the different doctrines laid laid out here. And it says, anything done in faith is not sin. And, you know, if you are going to tune out the rest of the sermon, that is the core of the message today. Anything done in faith is not sin. And we're going to go into exactly why, you know, forbidding marriage, forbidding food is really, really bad. And there's a lot of theological reasons for that. 
But at the core of it, what Paul is trying to communicate to Timothy is this very message that we can do things in faith and by doing so, we are not sinning. But before we dive deep into um, talking about the doctrines of demons and abstinence from marriage and food, there's an interesting phrase right at the beginning of chapter four. And I want to take some time to talk about it because we don't have these verses pop up a lot in scripture. And it's talking about the Holy Spirit. It says right away, now the Spirit expressly says that in later times, dot, dot, dot. Well, if you notice, and if you're paying attention, chapter 3 talks a lot about the mystery of Christ, right? He was incarnate. He became flesh. And we have a lot of verses in the New Testament detailing the doctrine of Christ, as we would call it. But we don't have a lot of verses that expressly talk about the Spirit, And so when we do, I always like to take some time to understand the role of the Holy Spirit because sometimes I think we forget that he exists sometimes. And then sometimes the doctrine of the Holy Spirit gets so twisted into these weird teachings that people get really confused, or I have been in the past. So I want to start with John chapter 14, verses 15 through 17. And just a heads up, we're going to run through a bunch of different Bible verses to kind of talk about who the Holy Spirit is and why it's important in this context. So we're starting at John chapter 14, and Jesus is talking to his disciples. And he says to them, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. And I will ask the Father, and he will give you another helper. So I'll pause right there. Right there in one verse, what we see is Christ as mediator, talking to Father, God the Father, the God, who is going to then give, the Father will give another helper, that is the Spirit. And this helper, as Christ continues, is to be with you forever. Surely the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it neither sees him nor knows him. You know him, for he dwells among you and will be in you. So we see right there that there was a time when the Holy Spirit was not poured out, was not indwelling in people. But at that moment, it was with the disciples because Christ was present. But as time progressed and the uh, fulfillment of all revelation came to being, we see that the Spirit then was pulled up and or poured out and Christ ascended into heaven. And so I have two passages a little longer that I want to talk about uh, the progression of the pouring out of the Spirit and the ascension of Christ, starting in Luke chapter 24, verses 44 through 53. It says, uh, Then he said to them, These are my words that I spoke to you while I was still with you, that everything written about me in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms must be fulfilled. Then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures and said to them, Thus it is written that the Christ should suffer and on the third day rise from the dead, and that repentance and forgiveness of sin should be proclaimed in his name to all the nations, beginning from Jerusalem. You are witnesses of these things, and behold, I am sending the promise of my Father upon you. But stay in the city until you are clothed with power from on high." Then he led them out as far as Bethany, and lifting up his hands, he blessed them. While he blessed them, he parted from them and was carried up into heaven. And they worshipped him and <laughs> returned to Jerusalem with great joy, and were continually in, the temple of, and continually in the temple blessing God. So we see here that there's Christ ascended, and he sat at the right hand of the Father. Right? He's physically in one location. And they were waiting for a promise, and that promise was the Holy Spirit. Now, if you turn to Acts chapter 1, we see there's actually a a summary of that very same story and then the uh, further explanation of the pouring out of the Holy Spirit. So Acts chapter 1, I'm going to start in verse 1 and read to 11. In the first book, O Theophilus, I have dealt with all that Jesus began to do and teach until the day uh, when he was taken up after he had given commands through the Holy Spirit to the apostles whom he had chosen. 
To them, he presented himself alive after his suffering by many proofs, appearing to them during 40 days and speaking about the kingdom of God. And while staying with them, he ordered them not to depart from Jerusalem, i.e. Luke chapter 24, verse 50, uh, but to wait for the promise of the Father, which he said, you heard from me. For John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit, not many days from now. So when they had come together, they asked him, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? He said to them, it is not for you to know times or seasons that the Father has fixed by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. And when he had said these things, as they were looking on, he was lifted up and a cloud took him out of their sight. And while they were gazing into heaven, as he went, behold, two men stood by them in white robes and said, men of Galilee, why do you stand looking into heaven? This Jesus, whom is taken up from you into heaven, will come in the same way as you saw him go into heaven. And then it continues on, I'm not going to read the rest of the passage, that after Christ ascended, the Holy Spirit then came into the people there and they started uh, speaking to one another, and then Peter preached a sermon. Now, I bring all this up because what we want to see is that the Holy Spirit has the same authority as God the Father and God the Son, right? Three persons, one essence. They are distinct, but they are also the same. The Spirit is the one who indwells the believer, and for Paul, saying that the Spirit expressly says is akin to saying God says this, a commandment from God. And it's really important to remember that because I think in modern times, a lot of times people will use uh, the name of the Holy Spirit very loosely. They will say, oh, the Spirit told me, the Spirit told me, the Spirit told me. And we should be careful when we say that because when we say the Spirit told me, Paul and other apostles use it as if it is authoritative word and revelation from God. So we want to be very mindful that our language about God conveys a lot of information about our belief and is very important for our own sanctification as well. Because if we talk about the spirit in such a way, many times people will not believe that we are actually of God because said things don't come to pass very often. Now, I'm not thinking of anyone in particular here. I'm thinking of my own experiences and how, the, how those phrases are often used, uh, primarily in the modern Pentecostal movement. Um, but continuing on, uh, I want to I point out that this notion of the spirit of truth is really important because the spirit is speaking truth to Timothy here. The spirit is revealing and helping Paul interpret and understand the scriptures of old so that Timothy may be able to instruct people in all godliness. And that spirit of truth is picked up, uh, if you want to turn to 1 John chapter 4, verse 6. You notice John has a very similar stance of what I've just uh, kind of talked about in terms of the spirit pouring into the apostles and then them, them teaching the people about God. He says, We are from God. Whoever knows God listens to us. Whoever is not from God does not listen to us. By this we know the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. So we have a contrast there, a contrast there. Spirit of truth, spirit of error. And we're going to see that exact same contrast in our verse today. Doctrine of demons, godliness, right? Same contrast there. <coughs> now, Another phrase that I want to quickly touch on, which can be loaded and depending on your background, um, you know, might entail or imply certain things, is this phrase called the last days in verse 1, chapter, uh, 1 Timothy chapter 4. Because it says, now the Spirit expressly says that in the latter times, or many times it will say the last days. Uh, and then what may come to mind uh, if you grew up in certain denominations or certain circles is, oh, there's a seven year tribulation. Oh, th three and a half years in, we might get raptured. Oh, are we in the last days? Oh, the last days actually happened and were finished when Jerusalem was, uh, the temple was destroyed and Jerusalem was sacked by Rome. 
And so there's a lot of confusion, um, and I've been in all of these circles that I mentioned, and so I had a lot of confusion as well for much of my Christian life until about five, four years ago when I started seminary, and it started to clear up. So when in doubt, I want us to turn to scripture. Joel chapter two, verse 28. It says, and it shall come to pass afterwards that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your old men shall dream dreams and your young men shall see visions. Now you might be thinking there's no last latter days or last days in that verse. And there's not. But if we turn to Acts chapter 2 verse 17, we see that Peter, after being indwelt with the spirit, after Christ's resurrection, quotes this passage. And before quoting this passage, he says thus, and in the last days, it shall be, God declares. And then he quotes Joel chapter 2, verse 28. What we see there is after the ascension of Christ comes the last days. Now, why is that? Like, where is, is there other verses that support this idea? There is. Hebrews, the letter to the Hebrews, chapter 1, verses 1 through 3, talks about the progressive revelation of God. That is the revelation over time, not progressive in the others, any other sense of the word. Long ago, at many times and in many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets. That's how God revealed his will, was through the prophets to his people. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his son, whom he appointed the heir of all things, through whom he also created the world. He is the radiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint of his nature. There's a plug for uh, Christ and the Father, the Son and the Father being of one essence. And he upholds the universe by the word of his power. After making purifications for sins, he sat down at the right hand of majesty on high. And so what we see here is that in latter times, in the old covenant, in the old mediation of the one covenant, the same promise, the same law of God, God spoke through the prophets. But God has finished speaking, and he finished speaking through his son. And it is the spirit who then helped them, the apostles, interpret what had happened in Christ's life. What had happened when the fulfillment and the fullness of time had already come. And the spirit then worked through the apostles to write these letters and to interpret the scriptures. As Jesus pointed out in cha Luke chapter 24, when he was with the apostles, he opened their minds to understand the scriptures. Well, how did he do that? The Holy Spirit. And so we can have confidence that the Holy Spirit here is acting in an authoritative matter with God the Father and God the Son. He is speaking what is true and he is interpreting what has been said of old with the fullness of time and the fullness of revelation in Christ Jesus. Now, that was a little uh, crash course on the doctrine of the Spirit. I may have said a lot of words that some of you might not be familiar with, um, but I wanted to make it succinct. And I wanted you to take home this one important thing or two important things with that. First, the spirit speaks authoritatively as God. Second, the latter times, as mentioned here, was the time period that Paul was writing Timothy. He wasn't thinking of some time way in the future, although there is implications for the future as well. It's not, it's not localized to just his time period. It implies our time period as well. But he understood that people at that time in history we're doing what he tells Timothy not to do. And that's really important for us understanding the rest of the passage. Now let's get into the interesting part, which is uh, what are the doctrine of demons and why are they so bad, right? Such that people uh, walked away from the faith. They seared their own conscience. Well, in a nutshell, what is happening with the doctrine of demons is a restraint from good things. A requirement placed on people for their salvation, for their righteousness, that they may not partake in things that were created good by God to be enjoyed. Why specifically, though, food and marriage? What is so important about food and marriage that that is the essence of the doctrine of demons, the evil teachings that uh, Paul does not want Timothy uh, to 
have propagated in his church. Well, we read earlier in Genesis chapter 1 and Genesis chapter 2 that the, uh, Adam and Eve were given two main sets of commands. The first command, be fruitful and multiply. How do you be fruitful and multiply? Marriage. The second command, eat of the fruit that God made. Food. And if you notice in chapter 2, I think it was, or at the end of chapter 1, it says, and God finished his work on the sixth day. And what did he call it? He called it very good. So at the core, what is happening with these doctrines is that they're taking the commands of God given to humanity from the beginning of time. And they're saying, these things are bad. You cannot partake in it. Although God from the beginning said they are good. Now, why would they do that? Why would these people infiltrate the church and say that the material world or the flesh or the physical world is inherently evil? What we have is some injection of the Roman culture, some what we call platonic belief, what we call dualism. The spirit is good. The material world is bad inherently. Anything made, anything physical is inherently bad. That's what they would believe. Anything good is of the spirit. And we actually see um, remnants of this belief today, uh, and it has somewhat propagated some of the Greek Orthodox Church, uh, but you've seen it over time that people would believe they ascended to what, we call de what they call deification. They became like God by abstaining from food and marriage. And thus they would be closer to God and thus their sanctification and their holiness is dependent on if and what they eat. But on a more practical level, I want us to think about um, marriage and food and the desires of people. It's like 39 days or 40 days, I think, you can go without food. I'm not exactly sure the exact amount of days, but you can go a long time without eating. A long time. Much longer than we often think we can. Now, I want you to give it a try. Actually, I don't. Uh, you might be pretty crabby and your family might not be happy. Uh, but imagine not eating for five days. And then imagine the desire within you if you had a plate of food right in front of you. Think of that strong pull. You're like, I want to eat. And all of a sudden, you may be tempted to sin. You may lash out at your spouse. You may lash out at your child. You may lash out at your coworkers just to get some food because that desire in you is so strong to eat because we need it to sustain ourselves. This was their belief, these uh, false teachers. What they saw was that desire. And they said, oh, see, it causes you to sin. Therefore, you must master that desire. Therefore, you must practice abstaining from food. Therefore, you must practice abstaining from marriage as well so that you can master these desires which are naturally embedded in humanity to live. And if we think about those desires, it makes sense. Those desires aren't inherently bad, right? If you don't eat, you can't live. If you don't you know, have married and procreate, then society falls apart. Right? So these, these desires are kind of inbuilt by God and made by God for the preservation of life on earth. And so what Paul is saying here is that, see, these things are actually good on one condition, one condition only, and that is if they are received with thanksgiving. We can receive food, we can receive marriage and partake in uh, eating and um, marriage, not with thanksgiving. And that's one of the pitfalls that can fall into. If we do that without thanksgiving, we fall into what I, what I call carnality, or what the you know, biblical term, which is being ruled by your desires. Right? It's easy, we can see how it's easy to be ruled by desires if you just look at the world. Like, look at how ungodly people live their lives. It's almost as if their desires do rule them. There is an aspect of carnality in the flesh that is controlling their entire life. You see it with the cycle of college campuses. 
every week. They need to, many people need to go drink a ton of alcohol, you know, kind of bemoan their life, it, whatever reasons they're doing so. And then they go back and they reintroduce into life and then the cycle continues again and again and again. And they can't get out of it. It's a trap. They're ruled by their desires. You see it with sexual perversions as well. You see these people are completely ruled by these desires. But the question is, are those desires inherently evil? Well, if done with faith, they're not. You can't be sexually perverse if you act in faith i.e. marriage, one man, one woman, procreation, eating, drinking. That's why I put the passage Romans 14, 17 in there. The kingdom of God is not a matter of eating and drinking, but righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. So we can do those things with thanksgiving. If we receive the material world with thanksgiving, then it is holy because the material world in of itself has no morality. Well, I'd actually argue it does, maybe a little bit, in that it is good. God created it to be good and to be enjoyed. If you read any theological history, this is the doctrine of Christian liberty. Being able to partake in tobacco. I've, I hear that tomorrow is nat, uh, National Pipe Smoking Day. Uh, tobacco is a plant. Plants were made to be enjoyed, partaking in a good meal, partaking in the drinking of water, juice, wine, in faith and thanksgiving, not being controlled by one's desires. And so we see that one pitfall is, you know, the opposite side of what's being spoken here is actually carnality, being ruled by desires. We see that carnality partake, uh, play out in greed, Right? Being ruled by the desire of material things. Wanting more and more material things. Or gluttony. Right? You can be ruled by the desire of eating. You know, not being able to control. Not receiving in thanksgiving. And at the core of it, the pitfall of carnality, of being ruled by the desires, is the ninth commandment. Thou shalt not, or tenth. Thou shalt not covet. Is coveting. Wanting more. Not having and being thankful uh, not having peace and being thankful for what is given. That is why Paul in Philippians 4.13 says, I can do all things through Christ Jesus. What are all things? Well, he says before and after that it refers to being made high and being made low, being given a lot, being given little. Everything that he had was received in thanksgiving. And therefore, he was content no matter what he had. And similar here, it is very dangerous to then enforce on others that what they have, what God has blessed them with in terms of food or marriage, is inherently evil. That is what ungodly people argue. And that is why it is so dangerous, because it takes the commandments of God and it throws them away, and it brings in commandments of men. And that's what Jesus condemned the Pharisees for. Now, the pitfall that we are talking about today, not carnality, or that, I mean, that what the passage is talking about today is not the pitfall of carnality, but the pitfall of abstinence, right? It's the pitfall of you need to abstain from these different things. And this had implications also in, in their time with the Jewish purification laws of food, etc., right? Certain people would believe, well, I can't eat certain foods because it was commanded by God to not eat them. But what's not understood and why I kind of went into the whole theology of the spirit is that in the new covenant time, in the new mediation of the one promises of God, it is fundamentally a different, not a fundamentally a different covenant, not fundamentally a different promise of God, but a different outworking, right? Beforehand, we had the sacrifice of animals. We had that needing to be done continually to atone for sins. But since Christ came and died and rose, we have one sacrifice for all sins. And so when we understand the old covenant in that, in that light, we understand that there is freedom in whatever is eaten and partaken of in the material world. Now the question remains, does that really have a lot of implications for our current life today as we are walking in Christian life? or in Christian liberty, sorry. It does. 
And actually, in the past couple of years, I would argue a lot of implication. About three years ago or two years ago, I remember there was a campaign against Starbucks. And the implication was Starbucks is getting rid of Christmas cups. I'm not sure exactly. But the implication was simply this. If you go to Starbucks and buy coffee or buy food, you're essentially saying you're not a Christian or you're kind of putting in doubt your sanctification. That is what is spoken of right here. The exact same thing. Because in the Roman world, there were many people who would go sacrifice an animal to a foreign god, a false god that doesn't exist. Then they would take the meat and sell it. And Christians would go buy the meat and eat it and have a grand old feast. And people are like, hey, isn't that wrong? That meat was sacrificed to a different god. And Paul says, no, if it's received in faith, it is not bad at all because the meat was made by God to be eaten. Similarly, in our lives, some of these foods are made to be eaten and enjoyed. And so when the onus is put, or the, the burden is put on people to always buy from a godly company or a godly uh, government, I guarantee that you will starve to death and you will not drink and you probably won't buy anything because the world is dark. The world is evil, and there's always going to be evil people in it. As we saw in 1 Corinthians 5 a few weeks ago, Paul literally says, you know, I tell you not to associate with the sexually immoral if they call themselves brother, but the sexually immoral of the world, if you were to not associate with them, i.e. not talk to them, you would physically have to leave planet Earth. You would have to go out of the world. And I saw the same thing with companies like Target. And that hits us personally because me and my wife both worked at Target corporate for three years. Or she worked five years. I worked three. Right? And if we say that these, you know, buying a wooden spoon or buying a pack of meat that sustains our life is evil because some company distribu who's evil distributed it, now we are imposing a morality that God, imposing a law that God never imposed on the Christians or on the Jewish people, for that matter. Never on his people did he impose that. And so what that is taking and why it is so dangerous is it's taking the commandments of God, throwing them out and inserting some false philosophy and commandments of men. That is why Paul says that they sear their own consciences and they are liars, just like the Pharisees. But the question remains, well, what if I may have violated my conscience, or maybe I did buy into some of that stuff and I felt really guilty and I still feel guilty. Well, I want to leave you with this encouragement. And, and on, the, on the surface, you might think, oh, that doesn't seem like a lot of encouragement, so I'm going to explain it a little bit and leave it with you today. In Romans chapter 5, verses 21 through verse, uh, chapter 6, verse 2, Paul says thus, Now the law came in to increase trespass, but where sin increased, grace abounded all the more, so that as sin reigned in death, grace also might reign through righteousness, leading to eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. What then shall we say? Are we to continue to sin that grace may abound? By no means. How can we who died to sin still live in it? What I want to leave you with is this, is that sin and death was prevalent, but grace was much more. If there's ever a time that you may have violated your conscience and sinned, repent, and there's always grace. Come to Christ, and there's always grace. Wherever you sin, there's more grace than the amount of sin you did. Therefore, knowing that, the next step in our lives is thus, to not walk in sin. Right? We died to it. We died to those false restrictions that man puts on that God never put on, right? We died to all of the trespasses that we made against the, the laws of God, which are plainly written on every man's conscience. And so we're to walk in life, in faith. And so how are we to do it? And that's why I kind of started the sermon out with Romans 14.23 as the core tenet of the, the message, which is the way we walk in life and not in sin is in faith. Whatever we do in faith is not sin. If you go to the supermarket and buy food in faith, you're not sinning. If you smoke a pipe tomorrow in faith, you're not sinning. If you uh, go and get married 
you're not sinning. I mean, granted, if it's one man and one woman, that's a different doctrine, but you're not sinning if you partake in your marid, marital rights as well and procreate. You're not sinning. Those things are not evil in and of themselves. Now, you can be ruled by certain desires, but they're not evil. And so that's what I want to encourage you with is go forth and walk in faith. And by doing so, we can uh, put to death the sin in our lives, continually be sanctified and walk in life.